All right, here we go, officially. So, um, hello everyone. It's good to see familiar faces in there, and um, thanks for joining in. My name is Rochelle Danae Poth. I teach uh, Spanish and an eighth grade course that I absolutely love because it brings back, like, well, I'm not going to say how long ago, but I've loved technology, so I get to teach them about, like, all the technology that I used that we thought was so awesome back when I was their age, but look at all the changes over the last, you know, We'll just go like 20 or so years. You know, we can waver on that. But tonight, I'm excited to talk about one of the topics I'll be presenting at FETC in January, and that is AI, AR, and VR, which is actually one of many topics I cover in my eighth grade course throughout the year, but it probably, especially last year and now moving into this year, it's going to take up a bigger part of what I do because there are so many things that I've found that I can do with my students in my classroom. And beyond just like looking at the tech and what it does, I've noticed that using some of these tools has opened up other opportunities for things like collaborating globally, um, building social emotional learning skills, and just like the positive peer relationships in the classroom. And it's really fun to learn from them. And I know one question that I'm asked a lot of the time at conferences is like, how, how do you know everything? I'm like, I am not an expert. I don't know all that there is to know, but I do try to know just enough so that I can get them started. And then I let them kind of just take it where they want to go with it and take that opportunity to learn from them and for them to teach each other. So um, really briefly about myself. I, like I said, I teach in a school near Pittsburgh. I'm also an ed tech consultant and an attorney. Um, I do work with ISTE and as a volunteer. I currently serve as president of the Teacher Education Network, which is really great for me because it gives me an opportunity to kind of connect with educators in higher education. And so as a teacher in a junior, middle, you know, senior, junior, senior high school, I don't often have that connection with the higher ed. So being part of this community for the last couple of years has really helped me to make more connections, many of which are here within this group. Um, I'm an ambassador for several different companies, including the ones listed on the screen, um, a couple of which are the ARVR ones. And I've been really lucky in the past year to work on a couple of books uh, that I've been really proud of where I've shared some of my own stories, but the best part about these books for me has been sharing stories of other educators and actually a couple of my students who uh, I totally credit with them changing who, I've, who I am as a teacher and helping me to grow and kind of take some chances with learning. And uh, so side note also, in addition to that, is I co-moderate formative chat on Monday night. So love learning. I'm excited to dive into these topics tonight. And uh, I'll say it again, I am not an expert. I like to learn. I do a lot of reading um, on all of these topics. And um, based on the picture on the screen, you can see some of the people I kind of surround myself with, myself with. And for me, my biggest start, at least in the area of ARVR, has been Jamie Donnelly. So I'll probably make a lot of references to her. She is absolutely the go-to um, for all of these things for ARVR. And um, yeah, so if you have any questions, you want to chime in at any point, you know, I'll just get started. I'll probably ask you for ideas, and then we'll go from there. So first topic is artificial intelligence, machine learning. And, you know, I didn't know that much about it probably January of last year, so 2018, when I went to FETC. And I knew what, you know, basics about it because back in the like mid to late 90s, I was taking courses in machine translation. So I kind of had an understanding of how some of those things worked as far as like the technology and the computers, but I really didn't see the whole picture and what the impact was in our daily lives. And so uh, my opportunity came to do some research as part of uh, Getting Smart, which I am a teacher blogger for. And it's really easy, I think, for us, any of you that blog, to write about the experiences that you have in your classroom and just to do that, like that first person account of what you've been doing, what your students are doing. And that I enjoyed because I love sharing the stories of them, but then Getting Smart had these themes and one of them was artificial intelligence. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna push myself to learn more about this. And when I did, I was really fascinated by how much we interact with AI in our daily lives and then developing a much better understanding. Because for me, when I thought about AI, I thought about movies like iRobot. If anybody's ever seen iRobot and Will Smith and the robots are going to take over the world. Uh, but it goes even back beyond that. I mean, things like The Terminator. There's all of these other movies that have popped up over the years that now looking back, you're like, oh yeah, like these things were kind of in existence then. But what the definitions are that distinguish them, like machine learning is a part of AI. 
So artificial intelligence, you know, the, the fear is that they're going to take over as, as ed educators, like they're going to take over our jobs, they're going to take jobs from the workforce. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, back and forth with that. But essentially, it's their machines that, you know, can plan and they can learn over time, build skills, and use like really big data that humans are not capable of processing at such a speed. Uh, so that's very basic AI. And I have links and other resources I can share. Uh, machine learning, it looks for patterns. It kind of learns as it goes. It can analyze the information. Um, natural language processing is part of that. So when I did machine translation, uh, like Google Translate, it's just analyzing patterns of speech. And, you know, it's not a substitute for a human translator. It doesn't understand all of the context or anything else that would go into that. And then when you think about the neural network, the brain is amazing, right? There are so many things that the brain does all the time. It works so fast, but with this neural network, you got billions and billions of connections and it learns what things are and then kind of like sorts through the data and, and moves beyond that. So those are like the three big definitions that kind of, and there's much more to the AI and the machine learning beyond that, but just as a distinction. So one question that I'm often asked is like, what does the future look like with AI? How do we prepare our students? Um, is it going to remove teachers from classrooms? And I, I don't think that could happen. It can replace some of the tasks that teachers do, which then would free up the teachers to have more time to do things like interact with students. Um, I think that's the biggest perk with it. And I took a course, which the, the image that's on the screen now is from the ISTU course, which was absolutely fantastic. And if you haven't had a chance to take it, um, I highly recommend if you're looking for something to learn about AI, that is something I would definitely recommend because it takes you through from the beginning through you know, the end, all of these phases gives you lessons, resources, activities that you can do with your students. And it has you build your own type of activities to do and to use within your classroom or whatever your role is in education. So just a couple quick things. If you think about um, you know, personalized learning, we want to provide that for our students and typical assessments and things that we would do in our classroom, if they're on paper, that takes time to go through and evaluate those and give students feedback. But using AI, AI can then take that place of all of the time that we need and it can sort through the information. It can find, you know, interesting things for students to do and it can kind of create a personalized learning journey for them. Um, one example that comes to mind, there is a tool, uh, a platform called Socrates, or if you're back from like the 80s, Socrates. And what it does is students work through um, different activities. There are different content areas and grade levels that are available right now and they're going to expand. But as if each student would start on the same question, as they work through, it continues to evaluate in real time and adjust as they go. So it does you know, create this personalized learning journey for them. Um, personal tutors, right? If we're one teacher in a classroom of 20 students, you know, if multiple students have questions, AI could step in and kind of intercept and respond to some of those questions faster than perhaps we could get to our students. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer learning and all of these other possibilities, um, bringing tutors in or having access to the resources way quicker than when I was in school in elementary or high school. I mean, there's a lot of positive benefits that are out there for artificial intelligence in education. But I think the biggest concern is, is it going to replace teachers? And I actually would love to open up that question just before we get into types of AI, if anybody wanted to answer that. And no pressure, like if you just thought, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll say something about this. Is that okay, Mitch? Exactly, so, um, so I'll go first. Um, and I'll say that, that I don't see any time in the next 20 years, um, cause it's hard to see beyond that, 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 um, AI could possibly replace teachers, um, because the teacher's role is personal. It's more than, um, serving up a piece of content. It's also, um, establishing a relationship with, with a kid and, uh, and, you know, knowing that how AI works, I can't see AI really establishing that type of a relationship that a, that a teacher can establish. So that's my, my, that's my view. Yeah. I mean, that is, you know, you can have it replace a lot of the different functions, but that human connection, that human interaction, that's the piece that's like, you can't, I mean, I hope you can't replace that. That's where you're going to build those relationships. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Anybody else? 
And you can hey, do, I mean, oh, good. Hey, I would definitely agree. I don't see it replacing teaching. You know, I, I definitely see maybe, you know, an added benefit possibly or, you know, something to strengthen it overall. Mm -hmm. I agree too. And I, I think um, the, there's an expression, and this goes back even 20 years, you know, uh, the, you know, to err is human, to, but to really mess things up, you need a computer. Um, AI really has the, the potential to really mess things up because it's, it still is based on somebody set up something initially and that whoever, whatever people are setting up the initial uh, parameters for the AI, their biases just get amplified by the AI. And I think that uh, one of the, one of the examples of that is the Apple face recognition when it, when it first came out, mm -hmm. um, Apple tested it on their engineers where well, their engineers were uh, in California were mostly Caucasians. And so, um, so it did not work well for people of color. Um, and they had to do an awful lot of work to, uh, to fix that because they had to go back to the very beginning and then, and then have this system relearn facial, facial recognition. So, so initial small errors and small assumptions really get amplified by artificial intelligence. Yeah, and I, remember, I do remember reading about that um, after the facial recognition and seeing like they had statistics and everything in there. So it was interesting. They also had um, on Facebook at one point with the artificial intelligence going through and filtering and flagging based on hate speech and all of these other different topics. And it was really interesting to see the breakdown of what it was catching and what it was not catching. It was also, it was actually quite alarming <laughs> to be right. honest. Um, but that was a couple, you know, a couple months ago that I saw that. So anybody else? Um, this is Denise. Uh, I, I think, Hey, I think that, um, we're really have this, this big push right now for personalized learning. Um, I was, um, a member of iNicole for quite some time. I did a lot of um, online teaching and there was a big push for this personalized and there still is personalized learning. And I do see AI being infused into our classrooms, just like an, an instructional tool, like a Chromebook or an iPad. Um, so I see that coming and then we're able to personalize the instruction more with the use of AI and these virtual tutors coming into play. So I see that coming around um, in some way. Yeah. All right. So next, you know, looking at types of AI. So when I did my research um, for the first article, which was back in, I think February of 2018, I was really surprised to find out like how much we do interact with it in daily life and just some of the facts. And then you start to think about it, like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, just a few examples, like talking about you know, the airline industry, there was an average of like the average flight time that's actually human flight time on an, a typical two or three hour flight is like seven minutes and the rest of it is done with AI, which is kind of scary, right? <laughs> like You think about it, you're like, that's it? Um, and then just, you know, daily activities, which, you know, we'll look at some of those in a minute so you can kind of identify those. But in terms of like things that I do, some people want to know, like, what can you do in your classroom? Uh, or in your school to help with your teachers to learn about AI. And one thing that's really kind of fun to do that was part of this course that I took with ISTE was creating things like a chatbot and having, you know, it's machine learning, it goes through the natural language processing and you can, you know, we've all probably interacted with chatbots on websites, you know, you're not really sure if it's actually a person or if it's a chatbot, but you interact and you have these conversations and students can actually build a chatbot. So I've seen stories where you know, people working in say like as a media specialist in a library have a chat bot. So if somebody comes in and there's not somebody there, they can ask questions and the chat bot based on the questions has the responses to kind of direct them to some, some type of a resource. Uh, personal assistants, right? So many, you got the Alexa, Siri, Cortana, who hasn't been in a room somewhere where you say something like seriously and you hear Siri respond to you. It happened to me in my classroom with one of my students a couple of weeks ago. Um, but we can access so many things now without even having to hold the device. I know I have an Alexa. There's a lot of discussion, um, controversy, which we can get to a little bit later as well. But uh, 
I don't know, last summer, I ordered something from Amazon that I had ordered before just by talking to the Alexa in my kitchen. And it's like, how do we get to this point? Like, it's amazing what the capabilities are with technology. But I think the one thing we have to keep in mind too is like the tech can be great, right? Uh, but we need to have the purpose and focus on the why we want to use it. Like, what is it going to do to make our lives, to make our students' lives better? Or how can we prepare them for the future if these are the types of tools they're going to need? Uh, as a foreign language teacher, language translators are not my favorite because I, my students will tend to rely on those. And even going back when I took courses in machine learning, you know, the translations weren't accurate. They, they, the computers can't understand the context, especially when it comes to slang in a language. And so that is one of the problems. Now, I do know that people who travel, if you have the, the app and you have the Google and you can hold it up over a sign and it translates it for you. And then even thinking about um, the, the AirPods, is that what the, the Google, where it did the real time translation of people speaking between the two different languages. I mean, those types of things are, are pretty awesome and they do serve a purpose. So if you have two people trying to communicate, like what better way to have that where they can actually communicate in real time and it's happening right there and then. Um, video games. People didn't, I didn't actually realize it, but it's used to enhance the gaming experience. And that actually goes back to like the 1950s. And then smart cars. I didn't know what Uber was a few years ago. Um, a friend, Katrina Keene, coming to ISTE, my first ISTE experience, she said, yeah, I just got out of the Uber. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then since then, I've used it. I have friends that drive for Uber. But, you know, the way that it analyzes tra traffic patterns and all the data that it uses to plan all of your trips, like all of that functions with AI. So you have so many possibilities that like all of those, you know, the majority of them ourselves and probably our students do interact with those on a daily basis. Well, take a look at Facebook. Right. Okay. So Facebook, uh, their whole algorithm is based on what you click. Mm -hmm. um, whatever you click, they're assuming that's what you like and that the people who are posting that are the people who you most want to follow. And so all the, the um, posts that you get are the ones related to what they've tried to figure out based on what you've clicked and the people whose posts you've clicked in the past. And then that triggers the ads that you get as well. Yeah, it's, Unbelievable. And um, the one other thing I'll say is, I'm just curious, does anybody know what year the term artificial intelligence was actually kind of created by a team of researchers? Because it feels like it's like fairly new, but I mean, just because we're talking about it so much, anybody know? 1930s. Ooh, a little bit later than that. 70s? A little bit earlier than that. No. Split, the, split the difference. <laughs> split the difference a little bit. 50s? Yes, 1955. Wow. And uh, actually, Alan Turing started the research um, and started to lay like the groundwork for artificial intelligence research back, I think, in like 1948. Um, I, I think I remember that number because I always remember like birth dates of relatives and so forth. And just that date is significant in my family. But um, he created this, this Turing test. It's T U R I N G. And that is something that you can use to analyze, you know, the artificial intelligence ability to basically imitate human interaction. And so there, if you Google it, there are so many interesting things out there where like AI wrote a poem or AI created a news story or lyrics to a song. And it, it asks you to go through and decide like, did AI create this or was this human? And I did it. And I was surprised at how many times I was wrong because I thought there's no way AI could create this just because of the language that was used. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it was like every time that I said it was AI, it was not and, and vice versa. Um, so I'm curious because, uh, Laura, if, if you don't mind, because you, you brought up using Google and Amazon personal assistants in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to be a phenomenal application. Have you done that or what have you done? Well, that's, I have one, have not used it yet because my husband is the tech director and he is currently trying to figure out what network he wants that on. Ah, okay. So and what, he doesn't what do you want think? to just turn it loose. And what are you thinking of using it for? Well, to start with, I'm going to run that by my principal before I use it. Right. But um, initially, I was thinking, if for no other reason, kids can ask it a question, um, even though they're sitting in front of a Chromebook, they're not going to take the time to type it. 
they want to talk and get their answer that way. That's just the generation I have in front of me at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I figure they could ask those questions that are Googleable and they can get answers immediately without having to type because for some reason they can't do that. I don't know why they just can't. But um, my, that's what I was thinking. They could just, well, I go ask Google and that would take care of part of it. I want to use it for playlists too because it is so nice the way I can just give it commands. We have it set up in our house. It actually runs lights in several locations <laughs> through uh, the smart bulbs and apps. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I would do anything like that, but it would be cool to show the kids how it could do that. Like mm -hmm. if I had one in a lamp or something in the classroom to show them how automated it can be. Fascinating, thank you. Yeah, and that, that ties into some of the common uses. I mean, some of these, if you think about what you do on a daily basis, um, you know, if you use like voice to text and have speech, learning tools that you can use in your classroom, um, just like the one I, I recommend, Socrates, there are a lot of other platforms out there that are using AI, um, especially when it comes to, we talk about like AR and VR tools now and other platforms are using Immersive Reader, which you know, promotes accessibility, but also is based on using AI. Uh, if you talk about, like Laura just said, you know, the smart home devices, it's, it's amazing. They can adjust the temperatures and the lighting because it basically learns, you know, your preferences. Uh, that just still, I, I still think like, wow, as much as I feel like I understand like how technology, like you can read about it and understand like how it works. But then when you think like of the bigger picture, like how did somebody come up with this? That's what I think is just the most amazing. Um, you know, smartphones and the capabilities we have, music and media, it auto like, oh, well, based on all your previous orders or the previous right. songs you listened to, like, how about this? Based on your preferences, it's really interesting how it kind of tracks those things. And then, of course, online services, fraud. I mean, there have been a number of times where I've been out of the state making a purchase and it just automatically, it pings it right when I'm at the register because all of that AI is working there to like track your, your typical patterns of purchases or where you are and you know flags it as a possible fraudulent transaction was somebody going to say something well yeah i was just thinking and i after you get kids used to what it can do then i want them creating what can they make it do what can they do to make their life easier can they program anything to help with that mm -hmm. and i love linda edwards response also where she was saying it could pro possibly use to help special needs students mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of time your voice is easier to use than say maybe typing or your sight. We've had visually impaired students and it just makes it would make it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, um, and there, it's just, it's such a big concept and to break down to how it actually works. But then when you think about our roles as educators, you know, I'm just going to tie this one in you know, to the education. So thinking about assessing students and how much time it takes to you know, create the assessment, get them back from students, grade them, give them the feedback and all of that, where depending on what kind of you know, class you teach or the, the type of assessment that you've given, it's very time consuming. We want students to have like meaningful, timely, authentic feedback. And so that is, I think, a definite plus when it comes to the AI, if you have something that can automate that grading and give you that data really quickly so that then you can act upon it uh, and there's a lot of platforms out there that kind of track students' responses, um, but they also help teachers too. So if, if there's like a trend where students have all answered incorrectly to a question, it sends alerts to teachers so they can kind of look at that and say, hmm, I wonder why, and then take a look and then act on that because, you know, that is definitely a teaching point. Were you going to so say if, something? So, yes, yeah, so I was going to say, so if all your students get the same question wrong, then you just replace your students who are going to get right? Uh -huh. or, do you have, or do you have to change the way you teach? Uh, I don't, what, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. But you know, and I do that now as it is like a lot of times when I go back and I look, cause I mean, nothing is perfect. Everybody humans, we all make mistakes. And there have been times where even, and I don't tend to use like Scantron, but sometimes at the end of the year with time being, you know, critical, I will for a portion do that. And there've been times where they've been marked incorrectly and I'll have students say, Hey, wait a minute. And, but I've gotten better. I've started to kind of look at those across the board. If I see patterns of like everybody missing a strand, I figure actually first, I think I marked the key wrong. <laughs> I think it's me. And then second, I think, okay, but I better check, you know, the machine. And so sometimes it's like a mix of both of those. Um, but then even like things like, you know, tutoring, having the opportunity for students to 
um, you know, we can use these tutors and it's like teaching them the basics or the fundamentals, but not really helping them to like apply it at a higher skill or making a connection, like a personal connection to it. So you, we can all look at something online and learn a lesson, but whenever you have that teacher to have that human connection, to make it more authentic with a conversation or a personal example, that's where, you know, the, the human the educator is going to win out over the AI, no matter how, I mean, that's my opinion, no matter how good the AI is at doing all the other tasks, having those connections and those relationships. Um, and then one other thing I'll throw in here that I found today that was kind of neat, it's, uh, I want to call it Snack Vids. I think it's S Snack and then V-I-D-S. And what it does is it uses natural language processing and artificial intelligence. And I think it's like the first one that you can do this. So I don't know if it works for every single YouTube video, but you can copy and paste the URL of a YouTube video into that website and it will generate a, um, it'll do a smart search and it'll generate like a transcript for the video for whatever's in it. So I thought, wow, that is like really interesting. I picked a music video, but I don't, it didn't work for that one. So maybe that was why, but it was just kind of interesting to do. Um, so some tools to try. So a lot of people want to know, you know, in your classroom, what are some things that you can do? And for me, when I teach this with my students, I give them some choices and I let them kind of explore. The first one that I tend to go to is the Google AI experiments, uh, which I could minimize and show you, or if you want to just go on your screen, if you Google that title, it gives you some options. And one of the favorite ones for my students to do is uh, quick draw or auto draw. I forget which one they call it. There's actually two that one's quick draw and one's auto draw, but it'll try and guess what you're drawing. It'll tell you. And then as you draw, it says, I see, and it names the objects until it gets it. Um, using things, you know, like avatars and programming to pro program, programming them to interact with students or whoever is another option. Another favorite, has anybody used that third one, the web genius? Nobody? It no. is like, so you go to the ac Akinator and it guesses either you, you think in your mind of a fictional or a real character and it goes through a series of yes and no questions and you just, you answer them and you're thinking, like I'm thinking the whole time, there is no way that this is going to guess who I'm thinking about and it did. And I was thinking about Don Quixote, like that, <laughs> yeah, it did. I was like, it started to get closer. I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I think he's gonna get it. So that is a fun one to try. Um, it is on the web. Sometimes some schools, it might be blocked. Uh, so of course, you know, you wanna check some of these things out too, depending on the level that you teach uh, or your role. And then there are a couple other ones listed on the screen too. Uh, the Brainly one, if students have questions about homework, they can ask and it opens up kind of like a collaborative feature for them. But there are tons more out there. I mean, the list goes on and on. And honestly, like if you use an advanced search on, um, on Google and you ask for like tools for AI or tools to use in education, in the mo uh, probably in the last three or four months, there have been a lot of things posted. I get Google alerts every day about these new apps and things that are out there that are based on using the AI in them. And so they're great things to try with students, uh, but also certainly you know, having them build a chat bot or, or work through those types of things, it's a lot of fun for them to do to see what they can create or just to brainstorm ideas of how that could be used you know, in the future. Um, so, that's the part on AI, but some resources that I wanted to leave you with before getting into AR VR would be, and I highly recommend Teaching AI by Michelle Zimmerman. That is the book that we use with the course with ISTE. And it goes through, you know, everything that you need. If you really wanted to like dive into this in your classroom or just for you to go through the whole process and to like build your own knowledge, it gives a lot of scenarios and examples and resources. So I definitely recommend this book. About two weeks ago, I got the book Artificial Intelligence and Education, and this one does give you a lot more about the research, um, all of the like, the ways that it started, the teams, the different ways that they started to use the computers. Um, it's a lot of information. So if you're looking for like a good combo, like the background and the research and then the practice, I would definitely recommend those. And then other things, like I said, the ISTU course, the organizations that are on there, and then Getting Smart does have a series. I did write a few articles, uh, those I can also share as well, or you know, if you look up my name on there, you can see, and there's a lot more examples in there of things that you can try with your students, and also just 
conversation starters about like, well, how do you think you interact with AI in your daily life? And, uh, you know, having, it's a, it's a surprise when you see some of those choices and things that come out and you're like, wow, I had no idea. Um, and there is some carryover between the AI into the AR VR as well, which is something new and exciting. So with that part, does anybody have any questions about or anything to add about the AI? Because like I said, I'm not an expert, still learning, but is there anything you wanted to add before we jump into the AR VR? Hey, can I add a, just a quick bit? Absolutely. Hey, it's David Lockett. Hey, I'm a, I've got, you know, with my STEM classes, I'm actually trying to incorporate some AI well. Uh, there's some Spark Fun kits that are coming out that are kind of AI camera based for the robots. We're testing them out this year just to see, you know, how the students enjoy using them, you know, and the different projects that come away from them. That's awesome. You, I, I'm just going to throw this out there. If you're not already following David, <laughs> you need to, because David does so much stuff. Um, and, and all of you do. So it's not just David, but like, you always amaze me with all of the interesting things that you're doing. And so I appreciate you. you sharing with that. Uh, anybody else? All right. So Mitch, should we dive into the AR, VR, MR? Yes. Let's go, into, right. let's go into reality. Let's go into reality. Yeah. <laughs> so basic definitions, you know, these are just ones that I put together. And when I start teaching this with my students in class, it's funny because I get so excited about these topics, all of these topics. And for them, one of the most common responses is like, I already know, I have Snapchat. I'm like, that's, it's not just Snapchat or Pokemon Go or something, but those are good reference points to kind of get into that conversation. And so basic definitions, you know, AR, it's, you can still see your environment around you. One thing that people tend to really like, I heard a couple of people recently say that they, they really don't like going to Ikea that much, but they like that there's an app that they can look and see what things from Ikea will look like in their kitchen um, to look at, you know, how you can decorate a room or something like that. So still being able to see the real world around you, but then having something that's kind of added into that. So there are some tools that I'll show you that you can get started with in the classroom really quickly um, that have lessons available. So time is always a big deal, but having access to things that are ready to go is always a plus. And then of course the VR, which is used and has been used for a really long time. We're just starting to see more of it in education, but you have, you're just totally immersed in that environment have the headset on. Uh, some things can be, you know, really great. I know people who have a fear of flying might use that to kind of get used to that experience. They're using it in the medical field, uh, the military, lots of things with business to, um, you know, train or to do interviews and things like that. I read an article today about how they're using AI and VR for training for uh, this one business. And then mixed reality, you have this merging of them. And so one area that I've read a lot about recently with the mixed reality is looking at the medical field and how you can have the glasses and they're kind of interacting with both and coexisting at the same time. And so training and having that experience or working in industry or in the, you know, in the army and just kind of doing that training where you can have that experience where you see what's on the screen, you can see parts of, you know, an engine that you're working on and it's kind of all there, but everything else is still around you. So it's pretty interesting to do that. And there, of course, a lot of people tend to go back and think about movie references where you've seen some of these different things being used. Um, Terminator might be another one. It keeps popping up. But one thing that for me, when I first started, um, the way that I actually got into VR a little bit was actually with Nearpod. And for me, as a Spanish teacher, we can watch videos or we can do activities in the book or look at pictures. but I can't necessarily take them like, hey, you know what, let's go out, let's jump on the bus and go fly to South America or go to Spain. I mean, that would be awesome if we could do that. But realistically, it's not possible at a moment's notice. So a few years ago, when I started to use Nearpod, the reason that I did was because they had those virtual tours, which are powered by 360 cities. And so I can then have my students with other activities in the lesson, interact and look at spaces of places that they're studying and just look around and become curious for those environments they're learning about. And so for me, for some of my students who for a long time were kind of against technology, the first time that we did that, they were just completely drawn in because they could then look at like Machu Picchu or they could look at parts in Spain. And so the image that's on the screen, 
that was the first time that I actually used it with Spanish three. And one of the students uh, surprised me. It was very much, and I've told the story so many times, he really did not want to use technology. And we did the lesson with Nearpod and it was around the time that the students had to create a project about camping. And I said, I, it doesn't matter what you use. If you want to do a skid, if you want to use whatever platform. So a week later he came in and he said, I have my Nearpod. And I said, I don't, I don't know what you mean. He said, I have my Nearpod for my project. And I said, well, what did you do? He said, did I do it wrong? And I said, well, I'm not really sure what you did. He was so impressed by having had that experience that we did that he decided to make his own Nearpod lesson where he asked questions. He put in a video about camping and he added in different places in um, Central and South America for people to explore that tied into the camping unit. And so I was ready to present the lesson, but he told me since he had created that he was the teacher. So you can kind of see his legs. He made a space in the center of the room. So I thought that's when you know that it's making a difference is when the students want to go and like create something on their own and they're more engaged with it. So for me, you know, like I said, Nearpod, there are many uses. They even have 3D objects. It's really easy to create lessons. And, you know, a lot of people have used it, but now they recently added Immersive Reader, which is something that I've seen a lot of these other companies doing, which is great for accessibility. There are so many um, potentials, or there's a lot of potential for learners to use this Immersive Reader with tools like this. And if you want to give it a try, that is a code that will give you a three month kind of upgrade. But it's, it's a nice way if you just kind of want to see what's out there and use some of the lessons available and give students that chance to look. And they don't necessarily have to put their head in the, in the headset because some students do get that kind of like you know, that off balance feeling. Some of mine just like using it on their phone or on their iPad, but giving them that opportunity to look around a space and you can do so much with it. You can have them do a scavenger hunt. You can have them describe things if it's an Whatever your class is, if you're looking at, you're talking about math or history or even like studying architecture, lots of potential in looking at those spaces that otherwise like we can't necessarily dive right out of our classroom to get to. So for me, that was the first one. Um, another one that I really love to recommend a lot of the time is 3D Bear. And a lot of great things about 3D Bear, I've, I only know about it because of Jamie Donnelly. And so I've learned a lot from her and they keep adding more and more to the platform, which really makes it great, especially for educators when it comes to time and not necessarily having a ton of time to do things, having a starting point with lessons that even if it's not necessarily in your grade band or content area, you have that idea that you can start with and then you can build upon that. And so if you have not checked into it yet, I would recommend that you do check out 3D Bear and there, there are some fun things going on with 3D Bear right now. And Mitch, and I don't know if anybody's asking questions in the chat too. I don't want to pop that down, but in no, the event Rodney, somebody does. Rodney is blaming me for introducing him to 3D Bear. Oh, <laughs> all right. Me? Um, better you, better you than, uh, than I, because usually I get the blame. But, um, but yeah, 3D Bear, and I didn't necessarily know the potential of it until, and now I'm going to blame Mitch, until Mitch put that scary animal over my head at FETC, which I didn't know about, uh, but it's a lot of fun. And there's always new objects being added and you can really adapt it to any type of level or content area that you're teaching. Um, have students, you know, go out the, to the town and talk about the town and add characters in and narrate a story. Uh, like I said, there's lesson plans available. You know, I could play some of these fun videos and you can see on the screen, like I put a bunch of random objects in my kitchen just to try it out, but it was a lot of fun to create. It's very easy to create. And there are videos available. If you want some quick tutorials to show you, um, that's also an option. And then for student creation ideas, um, you know, I have done where students can create an about me or talk about an event, summarize a book. So rather than, and a lot of times students will come in and tell me like, oh, I have to do a book summary. So I just, I, I don't feel like writing it out. And I said, well, why don't we work with my class and with these other classes and do something together so it's a little bit more meaningful. And so they have done things like a book summary or even like or open house or parent night, you know, create a video for parents or for new students. There are some challenges going on now. Um, and I do have the information there and the information is on the website. And I think, am I right this week, Mitch? It's a 3D bear brain break. I think it goes right. through. Yep, today, Wait, this, yep. Thursday, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Every, every week there's a new challenge. 
Yeah. So you want to do that because it's fun to create and it gives you, you know, get you out of your comfort zone a little bit and take some risk with it. But there are some really fun things. I don't know if the audio will play, but I created, you know, can you hear it? No, unfortunately. Okay. Well, it was just dancing and just character around the holidays. Um, the one picture on the bottom when we were at TCA this year, uh, Jamie Donnelly had taken a picture in front of the Alamo and had some characters animated. And it was a lot of fun because she always has the best ideas when it comes to these types of things. And so 3D Bear is one that, like I said, if you haven't had a chance to check into it, this would be the time, especially with the challenges going on. Um, and there are also lessons. There are some blogs available where people talk about some of the things that they've done in their own classroom. And even if it doesn't seem like, oh, like I teach high school and this is middle school, you just have to you know, ask the students or just kind of think a little bit creatively of how you can kind of add you know, something into it that would be a, you know, meaningful for your students as well. Yeah, I put a link in because it's just a new thing uh, that I created. And you, and you don't have to use it just for 3D Bear, although obviously I prefer you to, is a set of cards that you use as prompts for kids to do creative writing. And in this case, the kids would, you know, using 3D Bear, you know, you'd give the cards to the kids and then they would create a scene and a story in 3D Bear. So if you follow that link, you'll see that there are five different types of cards. There's preference cards. So a student or a student group would get a preference card, which is green, and then they would get a purple card, which is place. So, that, so a green card might be, it has, it has to use three geometric shapes, and a purple card might be farm, so it has to take place on a farm. And then a yellow card which is a character card, maybe that it has to have a pizza, it has to have pizza in it. And then once the kids have these three cards, you then challenge the group to come up with a story. Um, and you know, you could use, they could write the story. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we thought it would be really cool for the kids to use these cards to create scenes and stories that they then create videos and share the videos with. So that's the type of thing that you could use with 3d bear or really you use it with, with other tools as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so that's Nearpod 3D Bear. Co-spaces, and I know probably most of you have used co-spaces. This is another one that like three years ago when I started to use it, another Jamie Donnelly introduction. It took me a good day and a half to come up with something that was highly, it was not that good. And seeing my students use this in my classroom and come up with these different ideas, it was uncomfortable at first because I'm thinking like, I have to know how to do all of these things and the coding and all where to find everything. And I didn't. And so initially it was kind of like, yeah, I'm not really sure where that is. But um, the neat thing about this is that the students can create and then you can actually bring the objects that they create into the, your virtual space and kind of explore it. Um, I've used it in my Spanish classes, which, like two years ago, they said, how come only the eighth grade class gets to do fun things with the VR? And I thought, yeah, like how come? That's a really good question. And so I did then move it into my Spanish classes. But the idea behind it is you want them to create something, just like with 3D Bear, create structures, um, add in dialogue, record something, add in audio, whatever you want to do within that platform, but give students a different way to apply their learning it's not the traditional ways. Like for me, for years, I was doing the same projects. Every student had the same rubric, same, you know, final result. And it took me a while to realize, like, I needed to give them different options. And now moving to the future, like, we don't know what kind of jobs will exist, but we know that they're going to need higher level skills where they're problem solving and they're experiencing that productive, productive struggle, which that's hard um, to like, you look at something and it's like, I can't do it. Uh, but you have to push through it. And if we want them to do that, we definitely have to be ready to do that ourselves. And I definitely have, I have given up sometimes on some of these and I didn't know the answers, but um, I learned to start to ask the students and it made a big difference because one, I learned a lot more, a lot faster. And two, like they see that we value them in our classroom and that's really important for the relationships. And it was a, a way that I connected with a lot of students that over a period of probably six or seven months of the school year, I, I had been trying to connect with. And so we all have those students where sometimes you're like, oh, I just want to make that connection. You know, you really push for it. And one day it comes and it might be a day you don't expect it. And actually I had several within this same uh, using co-spaces. So whenever I started with this, um, all I had my students do, I just wanted them to create. I wanted to, them to explore. There are lots of examples that are out there. 
There's games they can play. Apparently there's parkour, which I didn't actually know what that was when they said it. I, I kind of pretended like I did. I knew what it was. I just didn't know the name for it. But a really neat feature that they started about a year and a half ago, maybe even two years now, was collaboration. So similar to what you can do with like Google Slides or Microsoft, students can be assigned to work on Teams. Um, and you know they can collaborate so it was kind of fun watching them work side by side and moving the objects on the screen what was even more fun was when I was across the room and I was adding things to their screen and they were like wait who put that sign there that says please stop talking and work I was like wasn't me but it was so it was kind of fun to do that but um, being able to collaborate and I did use this with my Spanish two students and had them tell a story using the vocabulary that we were on but then adding in different components to it and then it was really fun for them to come into class put you know load up the, their co-spaces projects into their headsets and kind of look around but also to see the Spanish text or to hear the audio that had been uploaded into that and they remembered that even the following year they, they remembered the vocabulary they remembered the verb tenses we were covering because they had that more authentic experience so when I see these pictures I just love because I remember the, the relationships they were forming and just you know negotiating those peer collaborations in the classroom and working together um, so there's lots of things that you can add to it. There are um, lesson plans that you can adapt. I just put a screenshot in of some examples, but there are a lot of different options there. So again, it's not like you have to start from scratch with any of these. You just find one to start with or even just start with an idea and get the students started and see what they create. Um, I did see an increased level of student engagement because they were creating on their own. They were excited. And I will tell you one quick story about a student and here's some ideas that you can just look at uh, for your classroom and these could apply to anything to 3d bear to co-spaces but I had a student this year that no matter this past year no matter what I did even if I was so excited about it, I'm like this is gonna be the day didn't matter finally when I got to co-spaces this year I think that at the end of the year this student had created about 20 different projects most of which include extensive parkour like I he wanted me to sit down on the computer and like figure out this game. I couldn't even like do the arrows. <laughs> so he got frustrated with me and he just showed me how to do it. But his mom contacted me and said, I don't know what it is about it, but he just, he wants to come home and that's all he wants to do. And he was doing the coding and everything with it. And I thought, okay, like that's great. It took a while, but that was a connection. So he really enjoyed that. And I mean, he felt good about like building his skills in his own way, in his own time and space. So that was one thing that I really loved about CoSpaces. Um, and before I go to Merge Cube, I did want to call out, well, I want to see if anybody had any comment, uh, but Laura did something really neat with CoSpaces, and I'm, I'm, I wonder if she's thinking, like, I hope she doesn't say anything. <laughs> well, no, but you have to tell. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can't see. kind of did type it, but I had my English 2 students take CoSpaces and create picture books, only instead of just the flat 2D, the page that you would design a... Um, picture for with your story they had to design the entire scene um, and then we shared those nationally actually with kindergarten classes so my sophomores wrote books for kindergartners to read and then the kindergartners um, would give us feedback and that my kids just love that talk about authentic audience oh yeah yeah I had fun with a five-year-old um, he and I you know you know the song down by the bay so it's, it's down by the bay where the watermelons grow, back to my home, I dare not go, because if I do, my mommy will say, and then you come up with a rhyme. Have you ever seen a bear with a polka dot, with polka dot hair, or you know whatever the, the rhyme is? So he and I came up with around four or five different rhymes, and then, uh, I mean, we use 3D Bear, but, and then we, we built those scenes, and then he acted in those scenes as we were both singing the song. So we, we had a blast. That's cool. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah, but I love that, like in the students creating things for other students and just feeling like that value um, of, you know, and it's authentic. It's not just, oh, let's create a project and forget about it. I mean, it was something that was going to have, you could use later on and it was, uh, you know, a teaching tool. So that was great. Uh, another one that a lot of people know now, the Merge Cube. Uh, there was the big, you know, back uh, two, I think two years ago, like people were trying to track down, like, where can I get the dollar merge cube at all the Walmarts? And so pictures flooding the internet of like people with buggies full of, you know, 60 hundreds. merge cubes, hundreds of merge cubes. I had my dad in uh, South Carolina go and get me some at a, a Walmart there. I was like, we don't have any here. 
So um, the Merge Cube is a lot of fun. It's a way that you can put that learning in students' hands and they can interact with it. There are lots of apps that are out there. Um, I wish that whenever I had geometry, for example, like there's an app, Shapes 3D, that I could look at those structures because I definitely think I would have done a lot better. But it's, it's kind of fun to use this because whenever we first started, I had the idea to, you know, print because people were sharing the layout so you could actually print your own cube. So one Monday morning I went into school and I decided I'm going to make the bigger cube. So there's the picture of it. I got manila folders. I laid it out. I taped it up. I made it. And I was so proud of it. After 35 minutes, I had my big cube. So later on, I thought, you know what? I should have my students do this. So I said, okay, who wants to actually use the cube? Who would like to try to make it? And I had everything printed. So a group of students said, oh yeah, we'll try to make it. So I set them down, set them down and walked away. And about, I, it had to be five to seven minutes max. They said, okay, we're done. I went, what? They said, we're done. They made three cubes. Okay. And I said, wow, that only took you like five or seven minutes. They said, how long did it take you? I said, not five or seven minutes. I said, if you multiply those, that's about what it was. But just to show you, like they learn so much faster. So if we take the time to learn this on our own, I mean, it, it, it's going to take us longer, but when we give them the opportunity to kind of go beyond us, we don't want to just teach them what we know because then we're, we're truly limiting them. But the potential for using this, uh, especially over the past like six months or so with Merge and the EDU, they've added so much more into it. Um, so you can you know, get the different apps and I'll show you a couple here. But whenever we built this, one other thing that was neat, like if you're looking at you know, access. We want to make sure all students have opportunities where they can access these materials and not every single school is a one-to-one -one or has, you know, reliable Wi-Fi. So the ways around that are making the larger cube, which then I had students who could, you know, two or three at a time interact and do a different activity. Um, setting up stations in your classroom. So if you want to try all of these out and you had 3D Bear and you had Nearpod and you had the Coast Bases and you had Merge, where you have students kind of rotating and working together, which is great, and coming up with new ideas or creating, because creating is important too. But that is a way to kind of work around some of those glitches that we sometimes face when it comes to technology or whenever it comes to just not having enough of the resources. Um, so let me go to the next one. So some new features they have. Uh, dissecting frogs, just an example. If you hadn't had a chance to do this, I did get some of these images from Merge. It does have immersive reader now, so that does use the artificial intelligence. Um, whenever you do this, like I held up the Merge Cube today and I was looking at the earth and you can pull apart the layers of the earth and you can look at the mantle, you can open up a volcano and kind of explore it. But the neat thing about these tools too, just like with 3D Bear, you can record the audio over it. So you can have the students narrate their own story uh, you can use some of the lessons that are in there for, you know, STEM and history and science. There's a lot of other options that are available, but I think any time that we can have students actually hold those things in their hand and explore. Uh, one of the other ones I did today was like the, the light prism. So you can actually slide on it and have it change the angles of it. You can duplicate it and like pull another one out and get a really closer look with it. There's a lot of text that goes with it and gives you information. And there's also a quiz with that if you have the EDU platform. So oh, anybody have anything to add for, and I know we're down to about six minutes for Merge. And I'll just put this on the screen for a couple other apps. And there's silence, so I will go on, because I did want to show Figment for sure, and there are, there are so many more out here. Like, honestly, Mitch, like we need like three hours, right, for some of these things I know, to actually I know. have the time to play. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's, uh, it's good to have ideas. But one I will tell you that's pretty neat, is Figment because it has the AR and the VR, and you can upload your own 360s, you can have the Google Street View, but you can create portals. Um, you can have a dancing, like it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but I, there's the background is the room, so it's just the augmented reality. I have the dancing turkey. I could add in effects like snow or fireworks. You could have music in the background if you have that as an option, or you could just narrate a story. So um, having students create something, whether, you know, for open house for parents, welcome them to the school and have these things playing, or even have a QR code they could scan and open that up too. That's always an option. But adding in different effects. But the fun part is whenever you add in portals. So these are images that I got from the App Store, but Figment actually adds both. So the left screen, the left image on the screen, you can add in some different characters. 
you can add in a portal. So like there can be a beach, there can be under the sea and it opens up like a frame. So what happens is as you approach that and you kind of go into that frame, once you're in there and you turn back around through your device, you, like, you can't see your real world surroundings anymore. You have to kind of look for the frame to go back to find. So it does mesh, oops, I'm going to go back. It does mesh the AR and the VR. And I can share an example of that. But one thing that I did is just in my living room over the holidays, I was trying it out and I had different portals set up in the room and I had the snow and I had music playing in the background. I had characters dancing and just was kind of walking through it. It's really neat to show, especially when you can demo it somewhere. But uh, the first time I showed this to my students, I was all ready to tell them, this is where you add the characters. This is where you add the portal. They didn't need me to tell them anything because as soon as they downloaded that app before I could say anything, there were giggles from across the room. And I, the only thing I could say is, what is dancing over my head right now? And it was either the dancing turkey or it was the dancing ice cream cone or something else. Um, so we had a lot of fun creating with that. But there are so many possibilities with these tools that it really mean, you know, you really just have to pick one and um, you know, see if you like it, how you can use it in your classroom, get the students to create with it, and then you know, just if it doesn't work out or you think, oh, I'm not so sure about this one, plenty more out there. And if I were to just mention a couple other ones really quickly, Google Expeditions, uh, most people have heard of it and maybe not necessarily used it, but it's a really good way if you don't have a lot of time to just start with your students, take them on a tour, pick a location, and it gives you as the tour guide all of the information that you need, and you can tell the explorers where to look. So I've even had students take on the role as a tour guide and ask the questions because you have the text there, they have questions to extend the learning, to keep the conversation going, um, and it's, you know, it's pretty neat to be able to do that and to take them on a trip because they're always saying, can't we go on a trip to like Spain or somewhere? I'm like, we can although we're not actually leaving the classroom to do that. So that is one. And there's also um, tour creator. If you wanted to create your own locations and just pull in locations from around the world and do like an around the world trip for your students. So I know that's a lot of information. I could keep going because there's way more, but that's a good start. I think that's a great. Start. I hope <laughs> anybody have any questions. Oh, wait, one last thing. I forgot. So if you're looking for a book for AR VR, I recommend Jamie's book right here, Learning Transported. Just like with the teaching AI, if, you look, if you're looking for a book that's kind of practical, that'll take you through the definitions, the devices that you want to use, the kind of headsets, and give you some lesson plans and you know, ideas to start with, I definitely recommend her book and checking out her website, AR VR and EDU, uh, the chat on Wednesday nights, which is coming up tomorrow night, hosted by Nathan Stevens. And then, of course, any of these, you know, these platforms, go to 3D Bear, Post Bases, check out the resources there. They're very active, you know, in the communities and Facebook. Yeah, so. I'll and Jamie, Jamie also has Global Maker Day, which is coming up, which you could That's right. participate in yeah. online. You can just Google it. You can, yes. Any other last minute questions? And I know I talk so fast and you know, thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> no, there was a lot to cover. So other um, thoughts about using any of these apps or programs in the classroom from people? I'm looking at the chat. Rochelle, what did you use when you run Merge Cube in your classroom? Oh, we did um, Mr. Body. We did the Galactic Explorer. And then there was um, merge, I can look on my phone because I always forget, I always want to call it merge it, but I think it's merge things. And it opens up, yeah, merge things. And it takes the cube and it has like four things, four activities on each side. So there's games and different things that you can do. There's like a volcano, there's a fighter that kind of reminds me of like Star Wars. And I just let the students kind of explore that, um, the heart, the Mr. Body, and just to see you know what they want. And the solar system is a lot of fun too, because you can, go in on the planets and kind of explore like where they are in relation to like where we are. So what devices were your students using? Oh, um, I, we have some iPads available in the classroom. Some students had enough, <laughs> enough storage on their phone that they could put different apps on their own phone. And, um, yeah, just basically those two, but we had enough to cover so we could kind of rotate because some students were using the, the desktops to do other <laughs> things like with the, um, with co spaces that they were creating at the time too. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna stop share. 
Okay, there we go. And um, yeah, I gotta go back through the chat. So, oh, and my friend Z is in here too, yay. <laughs> and my dad. <laughs> it's your dad. <laughs> yeah, so no, this is great. If you have questions, um, you know, my contact information, rdna915, I think we're all connected. Thanks, Z. And, uh, you know, share your ideas too. Because like I said, I am so not an expert. I'm trying to keep learning ideas. So if there's some way that you've used one of these tools, uh, let me know. Let us all know. Tag us all on Twitter or something. That'd be awesome. And I'm going to share my screen for a second because you have to see this. Because you're not, nobody's going to believe it. But um, take a look at all the sessions that Rochelle is doing at FETC. Oh, my gosh. Right. It's incredible. So, uh, so you can get a lot more expertise from Rochelle and she says she doesn't know everything, but she probably knows 90% of everything. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? Like, I'm pretty sure that I've, I told Jamie that she needs to be with me for some of those. I mean, most of them, they are on my own, but they're, we are doing a three hour, um, event on AR VR sandbox, which I'm really excited about. So I can't wait for that one. That was and, the second uh, to last item on the list. What? Okay. Yeah, I knew it was, it was mixed in there. So that's a long list. <laughs> but that's okay. Because, you know, I love to learn. That's how I learn. I get to talk with the people and with all of you and, and my students. So I'm excited to take some of these ideas and stuff back to the classroom too. So, uh, so we'll see you at FETC. We will. Or and before. everybody is going to do the 3D Bear Challenge, right? Before they got to do the brain break. Laura. Right. Laura does brain okay. breaks, so I do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Please. It's it's yeah. been fun. Um. And you know. Uh, and sharing the different videos, <coughs> and uh, and photos that people have, have taken, and I've had a blast doing it too. Awesome. Yeah, it is fun to watch and see what everybody creates. And I loved when we were in Nashville. Actually, Jamie did with the letters and and took our oh, our yes. book covers and put you know the our names with everybody's book covers in, and I was like, that is just awesome she didn't put a cat in mine though which was good because oh. that was like a first <laughs> yeah so well thanks everybody for coming for spending you know an hour with me that's awesome yeah thank you thank, thank you. you so much and um see so are you coming to nice skate did, did you were you coming to nice skate too or not no no okay no, i'll be at uh, rewire this weekend and then um teach better okay yeah, and T -E -T -E. rewire. I will see Rochelle on Thursday. Good. Yeah, awesome. Okay, everybody, have a great evening, and thanks for coming. And hope to see you at a future Ed Chat Interactive um, tomorrow night or in the upcoming weeks. Okay, so, thank you. Um, good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks.